When I'm out mushing is when I feel closest to God, really. Um, that's how when I feel God's presence is out in nature. And to be out in nature with some of my best friends, uh, God's creation, that's, you know, it's very spiritual, you know, for me and for other mushers, too. You know, my favorite times are, you know, you're mushing and the sun is setting or the northern lights are out or the sun is rising and you see the most gorgeous scenery. Mushing is a lot of hard work and it's not pretty, <laughs> but I can't fully describe what makes me do it all. I mean, I just love it. I mean, it's a place where I can escape. I'm hanging out with my best friends, you know, and, and part of it too is they love what they do. And just being able to be a part of that, watching them thrive and do what they love to do, and um, it's exciting and it's fun to watch them do it. <laughs> the day of the fire, it was actually a pretty nice day. I was laying outside in my lawn, um, letting a few dogs run around free, and I was just laying down reading a book. I actually got a text from my neighbor fire up the highway around, you know, mile 77, move in our direction, just get ready, have a plan, just in case. That's when I looked up in the sky and saw, oh, there's some smoke. But then another neighbor came over um, and said, the troopers just drove by. I noticed they didn't come down your street. They said, we need to get out now. And we were being rained down with ash. I didn't know what it was at first. I was really confused and then realized it was charred spruce needles. Uh, the Saka fire ripped through neighborhoods, destroying dozens of homes. My neighbors called and said, we're gonna go sneak into the neighborhood and see. She had just said nothing in our back half of the neighborhood survived. It's all gone. That I kind of lost it at that point. <laughs> You know, losing everything. It's stressful and yeah, it sucks. <laughs> but you know, as a Christian, I know it's just material things. You know, they don't really mean anything. Um, there, you know, there's a few mementos that you know I'm sad about, and 
you know, I can't replace. Um, but in the end, you know, there, it's just stuff. It's just things. I quickly was already coming up with a plan of what I wanted to do and get accomplished by the end of the summer, or at least before the snow flies, and went on from there. The Sockeye Fire burned 7,220 acres and destroyed 55 homes. Mary's dogs were okay, but an unknown number of sled dogs perished. The fire was human-caused. I named my puppies after the Sockeye Fire because they were born five days after the fire. So they are named Ember, Ash, Car, and Phoenix. The Phoenix rising from the ashes. <laughs> so here is where my house used to stand. It was, uh, after the fire, it was just a giant hole in the ground. I had a wood foundation, so it was just, it was just a big ash pit. Oh, what entertains me. <laughs> it doesn't take much to entertain them. I'm not going to start rebuilding my house yet. I'm going to start with replacing the garage, which I've started, <laughs> and put an apartment on top. So it was something that would be go up a lot faster and then that way my house I can really sit down and plan and not rush it and the plan will be that once I have my house then I've got an apartment that I can use for handler housing or if I find I don't need a handler then I can rent it I'll be ready to move in hopefully hopefully by November that's the plan <laughs> right now since the apartment isn't finished I am currently living in a RV I'm Scott. I, uh, I, I wore a suit for many, many years as a funeral director. And, uh, and it's what I did, and it's what I do when I'm working at my funeral homes. But uh, what I really like to do is I like to be in the outdoors. I like to do everything I can, and I like to do it with dogs. So these days, I'm a musher. I did her out as a journey, a thousand miles across Alaska, from Anchorage, of course, with the ceremonial start, from Willow all the way to Nome. It's a challenge. Iditarod is, uh, it's a lot like life, but in a very condensed version. There's a whole lot of heaven on the Iditarod Trail that's mixed in with a whole lot of hell. On Iditarod, and even training for Iditarod, just dog mushing in general, there are, you know, things can happen anytime we do anything in life, but the risks go up the more you push the envelope. The Iditarod is based on the the, there was a serum run back in the early 1900s. There was an influenza outbreak, and the serum run was how they got the serum for the influenza to be able to save the people of Nome and the surrounding areas. They couldn't get there because of weather. Obviously, there's no train that goes to Nome. Some people might not know that. There's no roads that go to Nome. Because of the weather, they couldn't even fly into Nome with the limited aircraft they had back in those days. So how do you get it there? You get it there by dog team. So what happened was all of the villages, people had dogs there because they were work dogs. That's what they used in the villages. So what happened in the serum run, though, is that, you know, most people have heard the story about Balto. And, uh, and uh, Balto being, you know, Balto helped to bring the serum up to Nome. But most people don't realize that Balto wasn't leading that team all the way along the Iditarod Trail. There were mushers that switched off in every village as they went along. And, uh, and so the serum run was like a relay race. So the relay race, instead of handing off the baton or the wand, they were handing off the box of serum that then continued down the trail. And so they had fresh dog teams to be able to break that trail through to the next village. They had fresh mushers that were able to travel on. And, um, and, but the difference there being, of course, we do it all the way through with our teams. So this guy, his name is Bravo, and he is... Uh who my kennel is named after. And I got him um, when I worked in Unilcleat for Siku Kennel. Uh, that's actually where I ran my first mid-distance race. I ran dogs out there for a year. And he was actually from an accidental litter. Oh, it was almost like he was destined not to survive. <laughs> not to survive, he's been through quite a bit. His mom was not even a year old, very inexperienced, didn't know what she was doing. She was actually uh, just this little village girl, little village dog. He, once he could start walking, he would follow me around everywhere. 
I would be feeding dogs and he'd follow me and if I had to stop to take care of something or I'd get a phone call, I'd look down and there's just this little white and gray faced puppy looking up at me sitting in between my feet. Um, he just loved me. <laughs> but I was still trying not to get attached. Until one night, um, he was probably three weeks old maybe, he was uh, missing. We went to the dog lot and he was not with his mom. He was not where he was supposed to be. We found him cowering under a freight sled. He was covered in frozen slobber. He was shivering. So that night I decided I was going to bring him home with me and I was going to warm him up, clean him up. And that's when I fell in love with this little guy. He was the sweetest dog. And he spent, I laid him on my pillow right next to my head, knowing fully well, you know, this is a puppy. I'm going to be getting up all night. He's probably going to pee on my face or I don't know. And he slept the entire night curled up on the pillow right next to my head. And he just cuddled with me the whole time. What? What? Until I brought him back up to his mom. <laughs> and there's so many other Bravo stories I could tell you. But that's the beginning of his life. And how he attached himself to me, really. He chose me. Until I learned that he's a pretty special dog and I just fell in love with him. He's not your typical looking... I mean, he's got the markings of a sled dog, but he is very long-bodied and very long-legged and I get a lot of remarks on him. <laughs> We are doing a little practice camping. We're not going to go for a run. Um, we're just practicing being calm on the line. And that's very important for the dogs to learn. So yeah, practicing camping, you want to do that often because, I mean, you got to have a routine down. You need to know what you're going to do and it needs to be automatic. It just needs to be second nature for your body because, you know, from what I'm told, being on Iditarod, you know, 700 miles in, you are exhausted, you are tired, you can't think clearly, and you just need to automatically do what you need to do. Guys, no. You are required to have a pot that can hold at least three gallons of water. Alright, you guys thirsty? It is kind of warm. So this is my stove for the trail. This is how I cook the uh, water for my dog's food. And the race provides, this is what we use for our cookers. Um, it's called heat. It's actually an antifreeze for gas lines. So if your gas line and your vehicle freezes, you can use this to thaw it out. Um, but it actually is what we use for our cookers and we pour it right into here and light it up. I just use a little bit of straw. Throw it, it starts really fast. You gotta be careful sometimes. And... The rain has caused a huge nuisance on my property, but it's created a lot of amazing opportunities for training, creating these ginormous puddles that my dogs have to run through. They can't get around them, they have to run through them. And especially for my yearlings, they're about 15, 16 months old now and they've never had to run through water before. Um, it's getting them used to just plowing through water. And they were a little iffy at first. They tried to either jump over it or go around it or, um, but obviously the team pulls them forward and they're forced to go through it. And now they actually like going through it and some of them will actually seek out the water to run through the water. I think part of it is it cools them off a little bit. But, um, you know, on the trail, you're gonna come across overflow, you're gonna come across water, rivers, creeks. Um, so you have to train your dogs to go through water so they don't shy away from it. So they'll just plow straight through it.
uh, when I think of Libby Riddles, um, Susan Butcher, uh, even Dee Dee Genro, um, I just think of gratitude. You know, they kind of paved the way for female mushers. Um, you know, I can go into races and going into Iditarod and not even think about the fact that, you know, I'm a woman, you know, there's a lot of men. Um, we're just all mushers doing what we love, um, which is being with our dogs and running dogs. Uh, general guidelines, accepted practices for um, using chains in the dog lot. They need to be at least five feet long and mine range between five and six feet long depending on how close my poles are together. And um, you know they really help keep control in the dog lot. It you know, helps prevent pregnant, unwanted pregnancies. Um, unwanted puppies. It depends on personality. Some dogs just don't really get along so it helps keep them um, separated and I know my dogs. I know who they get along with. I make sure that they're paired up with their buddies and they can reach each other. They're close enough that they can play together but they're not so close that their chains will get tangled with each other um, but close enough that they can have fun and play and interact and sniff each other and um, rough house and have fun with it. But really it just helps keep control in the dog lot and keep them all safe and um, happy. Another way I like uh, to keep my dogs safe is I have fencing and that was one of my first priorities before I even wanted my house to go up, I wanted the fence to go up. Um, one, I've got my dog lot fenced separately from my front yard, which is also fenced. And that helps, you know, keep dogs in if they do happen to get loose. It keeps them in and keeps them from running away. And because huskies love to run. <laughs> and, um, but it also helps keep stray dogs out, moose out, um, you know, unwanted animals or anything like that out of my dog lot to keep them safe. And I wanted my front yard all fenced in because I do like to let my dogs free run. And I let them off in groups I know who gets along and they love to play with each other. Um, and I'll let them off five or six at a time and they just get to run around in the front yard and free play and have fun and rough house and chase balls and sticks and just do whatever they want, sniff, and they just absolutely love it. So as temperatures drop, um, that's when we start adding straw to the dogs' houses. Straw um, is really insulating and it keep, helps keep the dogs warm in their little houses. You know, if the temperatures drop again, we'll add straw. And for me, about every three to four weeks, I'll take out all the straw in their houses, change it, and put new straw in. Now if it snows, you know, as they're getting in and out of their houses, they'll drag snow into their house and then the straw will get a little bit wet and then once the straw is wet it's not as effective in insulating. So I gotta, after every time we get some new snow I make sure I go out and check their straw. If it's wet I remove the wet straw and I'll put more straw in just to help keep them dry and warm and comfortable. When I'm giving new straw a lot of my dogs just get so excited about it. Some of them you know like to play with it and some of them will pull it out of their house and throw it in the air and then I gotta walk around and put it back in. <laughs> but a lot of them just love jumping in and start fluffing up their bed and moving it around and making their little nest and they just absolutely love it.
currently warming up my hands after scooping poop because it's very cold outside. <laughs> Attempt to start my four-wheeler for the, I don't know, 10th time today. Now that it's warmed up a little bit. It started out at 22 below this morning and it warmed up to three below. It's probably now eight below now, but we'll see if it starts. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if it's going to. I normally park it in the garage, but the plumbers had taken over my entire garage, so I didn't have room for it. Nope. I might have to get a tarp and tent it with a heater and see if I can start it then. I know, it's so close. <laughs> Alaskan Huskies are a northern breed and they are bred for the cold. Um, they have a double coat system where their outer fur um, or the guard fur um, protects their fur and insulates while there's an undercoat that um, is a nice fluffy fur that helps keep them warm in the winter that they grow for the winter um, and it helps keep them warm. It's like me going outside with you know my big parka and bibs and warm boots like they already have that on if it's zero degrees outside and i were to bring you know one of them inside where it's 65 70 degrees that's too warm for them it's that's a big temperature change and they could potentially overheat and a lot of them don't like being that warm um, they pant they're uncomfortable and all they want to do is go back outside you know when we're out on the trail you know it could be 25 below um, we do have dog coats that we put on them and um, most of them I will put a coat on at 20 below or so. Some of them they have such a thick coat that 20 below it's still too warm for them to be wearing a coat. Um, I put it on them and all they want to do is take it off. They try to roll around in the snow and try to shake it off. Um, so 25, 30 below is when I'll put a coat on them. If, they run, if they're not running with a coat at a checkpoint I will put a coat on them to keep them warm, keep their warmth in um, while they're resting. <laughs> Sometimes the stress just gets too much and it just feels good to cry once in a while. <laughs> um, <sighs> yeah, living in the RV has been pretty tough, especially um, we got dumped on with snow um, not too long ago and you, the musher in me was extremely excited, but the other part of me was not too thrilled just because it kind of put a hindrance on you know building my place and living in an RV and um, and then just the other night the temperature um, I knew the temperature was gonna get cold um, so I was planning on draining out my RV and I thought I had one more night of decent temperatures and I woke up the next morning and it was I don't know, I think it was like 10 below, and everything's just completely frozen up. I didn't um, empty my black and gray water tanks. Um, I didn't drain all the water out of my system um, in my RV. So that's all frozen up, so I gotta figure out how to warm that up so I can drain it, so I don't break anything in my RV. Um, and it's been very cold. <laughs> It just keeps getting colder and colder each night. This morning woke up and it was 22 below and um, my RV, it's, it's staying decently warm, but it's very drafty. It's very, um, you know, frozen pillows to the wall. Every, anything that's along the walls is frozen. I've got, I had a water bottle that was sitting in the corner of my bed um, up against the wall and it's frozen solid. Um, so everything is closed up as tight as it can be. It's very dark in there. It's very small, very small space. And it's just cold. <laughs> and I'm probably going through 20 gallons of propane in, I'll probably have to refill it soon. It'll probably be three or four days. I'll go through about 20 gallons of propane. Um, just trying to stay warm in that little thing. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, yeah, 
grateful that it stays somewhat warm, but it is frustrating and hard to hard to work with sometimes. So this will be my future home. Um, I think what I'm most excited about is light. <laughs> Living in my RV, I have to keep everything closed up, everything shut up so I can retain as much heat as possible. So it gets a little depressing in there sometimes. It's really dark. So I'm really looking forward to windows and light. Still waiting for um, a few things to be able to move into my place. I'm hoping, well, the heating system is almost done. Um, my plumber did leave me with a little heater so I can at least keep it somewhat warm in there so my water does not freeze, so I do have access to water. Um, but this week I should be getting drywall, and then as soon as my flooring goes in, I'm planning on just moving in, even if I don't have anything else, because it'll be a lot warmer. <laughs> there are times I wonder, like, what, what am I doing? <laughs> I, I, I'm living off, um, you know, I'm not off in the middle of nowhere, but, you know, it's far from, you know, most of my really close friends that I've known for years, and, you know, then I think, well, what if I, you know, sold my dogs, didn't mush, and moved to Anchorage to be with my friends, and then I just think I can't even comprehend that, because they give me so much purpose, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. I mean, they keep me grounded, they're my purpose in life, my dogs. Um, I honestly wouldn't know what I would do without them. Yeah. I have 23 dogs this year and with Iditarod and running the Yukon Quest 300, um, it's going to require a lot more food and I anticipate on spending probably around $15,000 just in food alone. I'm about to get uh, a meal ready for my dogs. I feed a full meal twice a day, uh, morning and night, and um, you know, feeding them a full meal in the morning means that I have to wait at least two, two and a half, three hours before I can run them. Uh, really let their food digest and, you know, so they won't get sick. And I start with a really high quality kibble. Um, this is a kibble that you would not feed a pet dog. Um, this is for active dogs who are, um, you know, working dogs. They're all, they're running a lot. You know, it's not just for sled dogs, uh, but it's for working dogs. It's very high in protein and very high in fat. Um, so we start with the kibble. Next, we add the psyllium, which you know really helps keep them regular. And we gotta mix it in. Since temperatures have dropped recently, we have started adding in extra fat. And I just got a big old tub of chicken fat. Because for sled dogs, fat and protein are the most important part. That is what helps them keep weight. And then last, I add, I have about five pounds of beef that I defrosted earlier that I will add. For snacks on the trail, I will use fish, um, sliced up fish, sliced up beef, um, into chunks that are just easy to chew up, and also chicken skins. They are a great source of fat when you're out on the trail and um, giving them a snack, and they love them. I know that they'll always eat chicken skins, so if they're being a little picky, I know that they will eat chicken skins. Um, so it's a good way to keep giving them nutrition and um, hydrated. You know, the frozen raw meat has a lot of water content to it. Over the summer, I got about ooh, 150 fish, um, fresh fish right out of the river that I cleaned and froze. And so this is the whole fish. And then um, some of it I've already started to chop. So then we slice them into snack-sized pieces. Really the most important part of fish is that they're about 75-80% water. So it really helps with hydrating the dogs. And that's why we feed a lot of fish out on the trail. When it comes to dog care, that's 
also a pretty good chunk of money that you got to spend. Um, you know, that includes vet care, vaccination, shots, uh, spay and neuter. If I know for sure I'm not going to breed a dog, I will spay or neuter them. Um, just one more way to prevent um, pregnancies and getting too many dogs. Um, but those costs also involve, you know, things like ointments and creams and um, massage oils. Like this stuff is what I use on dog feet. Um, you know, after a run, if they've got a little bit of soreness, put that on and it really helps soothe it and um, heal. You know, I've got some of these types of um, ointments, essential oils and herbs that um, I use after a run. If a dog is a little bit sore, I will use this and massage it into their muscle and it really helps with recovery time. Um, you know, I've got supplements like vitamin E. I've got one that is a probiotic that just helps keep their guts healthy. Uh, their digestive system healthy, you know, and I have um, dewormer, which, you know, you do often, they, since they are eating raw food a lot, especially fish, um, they get dewormed fairly often, just to make sure they don't get any worms. Um, I even have stuff like, in case, just in case they might get a little cut, you know, I can clean them up on my own, and yeah, all sorts of stuff to keep them healthy and happy. Uh, well, we live in California, uh, east of Sacramento on the Sierra foothills in a little town called Plymouth, California. And we're up here uh, to spend Christmas with Mary since she can't come down, since she's training for the Iditarod, she needs to get her runs in. Uh, we also came up to help her move in because she finally got into this place. She was hoping to be in here at the end of November, but uh, things went a little longer and she was getting rather tired of living in the RV so and then we're going to help her um, cut up some meat because she has to have all that you know she's got these logs of frozen meat that need to be sliced up uh, that she can put in her bags for uh, the drop bags where they did her rods cut a bunch of sections sections and then thick maybe and then okay once you cut those sections then it's even stacks on them and cut them down the middle as a child but very shy and um, we laugh because she hated snow when she was a little girl <laughs> she did not like snow in Richmond Virginia when she went out to go in the snow <laughs> she just started crying cause, yeah because it made crunchy noises she was always willing to try something once she was an adventurous girl but this direction we never saw coming after college when she was graduating she um, wanted to have an adventure and uh, instead of just uh, you know traveling like many of her friends were to take the summer off before they got their jobs she wasn't sure what she was going to do after graduation so she um, called and said would you mind if i worked at this bible camp in unilaclet alaska and um, she was going to give it what she told us she was going to give it you know three weeks to a month to see if she liked it and uh, would that be okay? And I said, sure, I, I guess. No running water, no electricity. And, yeah. <laughs> and she said, sign me up. <laughs> and uh, so off she went and fell in love with it and stayed. And that was nine years ago. So she came back to the road system and she got this opportunity to work with uh, Genre Racing Kennels. And that's when she decided this is what I want to do. Yeah. And then she was really getting hooked and so she decided she wanted to get, get the experience with a native musher. So back to Unilacolite. <laughs> <laughs> and that was two winters ago, three winters ago. And went to go work for uh, Mitty Johnson. Uh, but that was the winter where they had a month where the high was minus 30. 
she's out there, you know, twice a day on the snow machine to, to feed the dogs and, and, you know, scoop poop and, and minus 30 without a wind chill factor. Living in Unilocleet and uh, working with the dogs, she would tell us stories of, uh, and show us pictures. She had a nice blog mm -hmm. going, and this is where we see our daughter in bibs and uh, butchering seals on, yes. the, <laughs> on the shore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the other, when she was in Unicle, it was also her first kind of real race. She had the uh, second team, but she ran that race. It was Unicle up to Caltag. Nancy stayed up, and so she's watching the GPS, and here's the trail, and all of a sudden, Mary's like way over here, and <laughs> it's two in the morning, and she's going, oh, no. what do you do? <laughs> what do, you do? <laughs> what do I call? <laughs> Eventually, it got back, but then after the fact, we found out that as she was getting up closer to, to uh, Caltag, it was huge storm and wind, and she had the puppies, and all they wanted to do was turn around and go home. And so they were kept going off to the right, and they, that's how she ended up off the trail. And there was so much wind, the trail was basically gone. So <laughs> she said she, you know, she stopped them, and she just went up and hugged the two lead dogs and sat there for around uh, about 40 minutes, mm -hmm. just calming them down and calming her down. Uh, and then a, a snow machine uh, came by uh, to, to show where the trail was. And so the dogs were all calmed down, she was calmed down, she got back on the trail and made it up to Caltech. Uh, and then the rest of it was coming back, and the next day when she was coming back, it was crystal clear, and, uh, and you know, the, the sea out there, she's coming down, and it's like, this is what I want to do. Today is our first day. Uh, running on a sled, which always the first run of the season on sled always makes me a little, it's kind of a nervous excitement. Excited because, I mean, running on sleds is just so much fun. <laughs> and that's what mushing is. The four-wheeler training has its perks and it's fun and that's where you can do a lot of behavioral training with your dogs. But sleds is just what, that's what mushing is. But I get a little nervous on the first run just because you kind of forget the power of the dogs and how easy it is for them to pull a sled even though it has a ton of weight in it. So I start with a small team. I'll be running um, two teams today of eight. So we'll start with smaller teams and just get a feel again for running on a sled. <laughs>
you know, we go into each checkpoint and you have your one to three bags that you send to that checkpoint and each bag can be a max, can hold 50 pounds. But you add all those together, I mean, there's what, 22, 23 checkpoints? At the Iditarod rookie meetings, they had said, you better be at least sending out, I think it was 17 or 1800 pounds of food, gear, everything that you need. So to start Iditarod, you either, um, well, you have to start with a minimum of 12 um, in harness, you know, on the gang line, or um, the max you can start with is 16, and most people take 16. I might not be starting with 16. Um, I want to run with my own dogs. You know, I worked for another musher, an Iditarod musher. I worked for two Iditarod mushers, actually. And, you know, a lot of rookies will, you know, work for an Iditarod musher and then run their B team or their puppy team, and that's a great way to do it because, I mean, <laughs> you save a lot of money that way. <laughs> and if you don't know if this is a lifestyle you want to pursue for the rest of your life, then this is a great way to you know, run Iditarod, you know, get that experience, accomplish your dream, your goal, without, you know, being in it for life. Um, and that's a good way to be like, you know what, this is what I want to do, and this is, now I'm going to do it with my own team. For me, I wanted to do my rookie year with my own dogs. It would, I just knew it would be so much more rewarding. Um, and some of them I did buy. Um, you know, I needed experienced leaders and dogs who have run the trail before. You know, I needed some experienced dogs. But, you know, a good portion of my team is also uh, dogs that I bred and raised myself. So, since they were puppies. So, I'm pretty excited and proud to be taking them. Because of training conditions and being a bit behind, I'm afraid my dogs aren't going to be ready. Um, Sorry. It's just very frustrating <laughs> to kind of have come through so much and then not be able to run because we just didn't, couldn't get the dogs ready. Um, but that's a decision I'll make closer to what I did or at. I don't want to, I mean, we're going to keep training. I'm going to keep trying. Um, but if we're not ready, then I'm not gonna put the dogs through that. I mean, I've got six, six yearlings, um, and I don't wanna ruin them in the first year of their career. <laughs> I don't wanna give them a bad experience, and I did run. Um, and I've got a few other dogs who are older, but they've never run I did run. I mean, they've raced in my qualifying races with me, but not I did run. Um, and that's a whole other ball game, I did run then. A 300 mile race. So, I mean, I am. I am afraid that we're just not going to be ready. And that's hard to accept. <laughs> so, last night I came back from my short run, um, our last training run before we head to the Yukon Quest 300 and brought my sled in to thaw out, getting it ready to go. Turned it on its side and found that it was broken. <laughs> it was actually right down here. Um, there's some wood that goes along the bottom here. That this, The bottom is fabric and it holds up the bottom here and it was completely just snapped off. So thankfully put in a call to my sled builder and he this morning called me back and said, bring it on by because I don't want you going off to a race with a broken sled. So that was, you know, put a little <laughs> time constraint on my morning trying to get ready to go. Had to run into town and have him fix it. Thankfully it was a fast fix. So yeah, now we're ready to go. You can't go wrong with blueberries and carrots. <laughs> Peace for me. <laughs> the main reason that I signed up for Yukon Quest 300 and decided to run it was I knew that for me and my dogs, I needed 
a lot more experience in racing, especially on challenging trail. And I knew that Yukon Quest would provide that, and it did. Uh, we took a pretty tight turn, and I tipped my sled and fell, and I hit my head pretty hard, and a loud crack shot through my head. Um, and that was the first time I'd ever actually been scared um, out on the trail alone, you know, in the middle of nowhere with my dogs. Got to the next checkpoint and didn't want to continue on. Um, I wanted to quit at that point. Um, I, you know, I've had stress, you know, looming over me since June 14th, since I lost everything. Um, and that race, it was a pretty stressful race. It was a, hard, a tough race. Um, and knowing still what was to come on the trail, I was just so full of stress and anxiety and then having hit my head, um, I just didn't want to continue on. Um, but someone gave me some really good advice, you know, if you quit this race now, you will quit Iditarod. That's just what will happen. And that struck a chord with me. And, um, but really the main reason I continued on was, I mean, my dogs, they were doing fantastic. Um, they were really strong, they were running really great and taking everything that was thrown at them in stride and I knew I had to continue on for them. Um, and it would be great training for them for Iditarod if we continued on. Even though my mood, my, you know, I didn't want to continue on, you know, I still had to push through that for them. I like to call the drop bags the race in a bag. It's your entire strategy bagged up two weeks before the race even starts, which means you have to know exactly what you're going to be doing before you do it. You need to know where you're going to do your 24 hour. You're going to need to know where you do one of your mandatory eight hours. You're going to need to know what the weather's going to be or take your best guess. Um, are you going to pack extra food for places like Rainy Pass, Chactulik, which can often slam you down with weather. Where's your 24 really? What's your contingency plan for the 24? You don't have enough money, so you can't put 200 pounds in every single one of the 19 checkpoints. So you really have to pick and choose. It becomes a logistical nightmare, and God forbid you forget anything, because then you gotta pack out your sled for a thousand miles. On a scale of one to 10, on our readiness, um, me and the dogs, I feel like my dogs are more of a, you know, 9 or 10, and I'm kind of a 7, I would think. So averaging out to 8. <laughs> that's kind of my, that's where I feel like we're at. Busy, but I gotta come meet you. Yes. Libby Riddles. Oh, hi. Wish you good yes. luck.
Thank you very much. Say hi to everybody and you look late for me. <laughs> oh, I will. I think I'm going to have half a jump. Only half? <laughs> but will your dogs want to keep going? Is the question. I, well, I only have a couple, but I had oh. from when I ran out there. So, but one of them's a leader. They're trying to eat your boot. And don't eat my boot, please. Don't want to eat your boot on the first day of the race. That's yeah, bad. I don't want that. <laughs> okay, how bad of a rookie bulge are we talking here? Yep. Well, oh, that's good. You want to go slow at first. Yeah. Post office at Squenda, you can mail them. <laughs> she doesn't need, yeah, she doesn't need it. You know, I'm feeling pretty good. If I just think about the fact that I'm, right now, I'm just running to Yentna. That's all I'm thinking about. Then once I'm in Yentna, I can think about Squenda. That's about it. <laughs> Take it one checkpoint at a time. If I think, if I start thinking about too far down the trail, then I start getting too nervous. How are we feeling? <laughs> <laughs> I am overwhelmed with emotion. Like, I'm on the verge of tears constantly. <laughs> just so proud of her and overwhelmed with just happiness and emotions like that. Uh, I would probably say the one word would be just excitement. It's, it's, <laughs> it's just it's fun it's exciting who would have thought that i would be standing in the uh the mushers circle on willow creek uh i'm assuming this is a lake and uh, uh you know supporting my sister to run the iditera it's like what the so excitement also a little bewilderment i guess would be another word if i start talking about it i'll start crying <laughs> yeah yeah Today is a really big day, and yesterday the ceremonial start, we, um, it was fun. It was festive. Everybody was in a good mood. It was a good time to uh, just really, um, you know, appreciate uh, the sport, the other mushers, and, and the fans. And we're just amazed at how global <laughs> this uh, sport really is. And uh, today... <laughs> It's a lot more emotional. This is when we say bye-bye for two weeks. Week. 
could fly so high, so high. I even forgot my teeth. <laughs>